Right, since there's at least one person, hi Terry, uh, watching at the moment, uh, I'll do the obligatory sound check, make sure it's all working. It looks to be at my end. If you can hear me and see me, if you could just pop a comment in the live chat, that would be a great. And I'll see you at half past in 11 minutes and 46 seconds. Right, back to the countdown.
Hello, good evening. Welcome to In Studio Live, the 82nd edition. Wow, it's, uh, that, that's amazing. I thought this might last about three or four weeks, so to get to 82 is quite good. Right, anyway, welcome everyone. Uh, we have a slightly different uh, live stream tonight compared to the one that uh, I was planning. Um, I had to change the, uh, the topic uh, last minute because uh, I got let down by a model on Friday uh, with whom I was going to shoot um, the, uh, the video which I need to tie in with the theme that I was going to do, which is all about um, uh, available light photography. I know that's a topic we've, we've talked about a little bit in the past, but it, it's worth um, going over it again anyway, especially as it ties in with the current ex or the exercise I'm hoping to um, uh, show you about with the uh, before and after challenge and that's the, um, the the thing that I can't do because that was one of the things I was meant to shoot on uh, uh, on Friday and didn't happen so uh, quick thinking I've decided to uh, switch over to part two of the power of perspective um, this follows on directly from last week so no bad thing uh, last week you got the first half of it and I've I ummed and aahed on whether to do the second half or not last week, and it appears I took the right decision because you get in the second half this week. Uh, so, right, let's let's just get going, shall we? Uh, what have we actually got on the show? Well, it could well be quite a short show, uh, depending on what questions turn up in the uh, in the live chat. Oh, um, and by the way, welcome to everyone. If you are new here, do say hi in the live chat. Uh, we've got. Um, well, 12 or 13 people uh, watching at the moment, which is, is really good. Uh, so uh, great for that. And um, uh, I'm going to be doing uh, image feedback, but I'm going to be doing it towards the end of the show uh, because last, last week, after I'd done the image feedback, half of you disappeared. So it's, do we're going, to, it's going to the end of the show. That, that upsets my stats otherwise. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. Uh, yeah, uh, image, um, image feedback just happens to be that I'm doing it towards the end this week um, uh, on there. I ring the changes on where it is in the show, as you know. Uh, so it's Power of Perspective, and it follows on directly from last week. So if you didn't watch last week's, um, if this does turn out to be a short show, you can go and watch last week's upon YouTube and catch up uh, on there. And then after that, you can watch the other 80 previous ones as well and then you can be completely caught up for next week wouldn't that be fantastic that would really help my viewing time on youtube uh yeah i haven't got the before and after challenge because that was the thing i was going to record with the model who let me down on friday so i'm going to try very hard to get it done this week so that next week i can do that video and do the topic about ambient light uh, photography and some advice on that um uh, on there, uh, it's getting a bit lively in the uh, in the chat. Let's just have have a look what's been going on here. Um, we've got a couple of people arriving, and um, uh, uh, Richard saying hi, Julie. I'll be gentle with you. This is this is getting very um, uh, a, a little bit near the knuckle, Richard. Um, I think you might be wasting your time because Ju Julie is already married and her wife will have a lot to say about it. So just 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 watch it. Just watch it. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, yeah. Let, let's let's get back to where we are. Uh, yeah. So at the end, I'll reveal my uh, member image of the week, which will be the banner on the Facebook group. So stick around till the very end to find out if it's your image uh, on there. Right, as I said, it is interactive. Use the live chat to ask me questions and I'll, I'll try and answer them as we go through. The really tough ones I'll save till next week, but uh, do, um, do ask questions. I do try to um, uh, tackle them as they come through uh, on that. Um, but yeah, it, we can it doesn't have to be questions it can be the banter and all that because there's a little community that's growing here of people um trying to improve their photography and helping each other out commenting 
uh, on what I'm saying and what other people about other people's images and giving feedback is all about is all part of it. Uh, so do leave questions and comments in there. I do try to respond to them as we go through. Um, if you've got images for feedback, I'll mention this again at the feedback session. Um, try and send them to feedback at ians-studio.co.uk because I can give you far better feedback if they're emailed to me because Facebook does two things. It strips out all the shooting data, all the EXIF information, and it compresses them and their low resolution. So, no, that's three things. So if you email the original ones to me um, at feedback at ians-studio.co.uk. Now, if it's large files or raw files you want to send, use a service called WeTransfer and you'll get, um, you can transfer big files over to me that way. I've only got one that's come in via email this week. Uh, it's from, from Gary, as usual. Uh, so I'll deal with that when I deal with the, the Facebook feedback at the end. So it's just one chunk of feedback. But I really want to encourage you to um, um, email the images to me. I, I say this every time because it, it does mean I can give better feedback um, uh, on there. Um, and also, general information, subscribe, like and share. So if you're new to the uh, live stream, if you find it helpful, make sure you hit the subscribe button so you get notified of future videos because... This week, I don't know whether you noticed, I've posted a video every day this week, including two on um, um, a beginner's uh, always-on LED uh, studio, more video lights rather than, uh, than still stuff. Uh, but uh, also, the before and after challenges have been posted. They're all up to date. I promised they would be. Uh, so uh, do that. Join the Facebook group if you're not a member. Link for that down below. And join my mail my newsletter. Again, link below if you're not already on that. Right, that's enough of the, uh, the general stuff at the beginning. Um, let's get on with our theme tonight. We're looking at the topic of um, the power of perspective or point of view. Um, call it different things um, on that. And it's all about changing where we photograph and how we photograph and how that can affect our images uh, and how it can enable us to make better photos. And I summed it up last week with the, uh, the little phrase, put the camera where the eye doesn't normally go. So try and do, try and do that. Um, I've been bugged by little flies in here. All right. Um, in other words, if you can put the camera from where somebody doesn't normally view the scene, that will give a unique or different perspective uh, on that, uh, uh, that subject that you're looking at. So change your point of view. And we looked at three factors last week. Uh, one is the height above the ground, because our perspective, for most of us, is somewhere between five foot and six foot off the ground. Uh, the angle of view, because if we tilt our heads, the, the world does tend to stay vertical, horizontal. So if we can deliberately put a tilt in there, that changes the perspective. Um, oh, sorry, the angle of view, uh, <laughs> not that angle. The tilt of the camera is that one. Angle of view, so I, I meant the how, whether it's wide angle or telephoto, whether we capture the whole scene or whether we just focus in on a small detail. Sorry, I forgot what I'd written on that. Right, uh, last time we looked about the height, we looked at worm's eye view and we looked at bird's eye view and how that changes things. This time we are going to look at the angle of view, whether how wide angle affects and how telephoto affects, slightly differently to how we've looked at it previously. And we're going to look at how the tilt of a camera uh, affects the image we're creating. And I'm going to do this by going through a few of my images and telling you the backstory from them and how it works. Now, this is our tent in a field in North Wales, in the middle of the field, which you might think is a peculiar place to pitch a tent, uh, because normally if you go camping, you tend to pitch a tent around the outside of a field because it gives a bit of shelter. Well, when we arrived at this campsite, the, um, the field was completely full 
I, the only thing I can think of, there was a rally going on because it was full of tents. And the only place we could pitch was in the middle of the field. And we were there for about four or five days. And we'd arrived on the Saturday, pitched the tent. The Sunday we went out, uh, had a look around the area. When we came back, all the other tents in the field had gone. And ours was the only tent left in the field. And it was right in the middle of the field. And so I wanted to sort of capture this. Um, and I wanted to make it look really isolated. And the way to do that is to use a wide angle lens. Because normally what we see is a, an angle something like that. Now it doesn't show up very well on, um, uh, on video, but if you stick your hands out in front of you to the point where your hands are just at the edge of your vision, and that's your stand, standard angle of view. And that's typically about 50 millimeter, thereabouts. It varies in person to person, but it's typically about that. So if we can use a wide angle, what are we doing? We're capturing a much wider view. We're compressing that into a smaller area. So we are producing an image which the eye can't normally see. So the only way I could see the view that's in that picture is by moving my head around. And now I've compressed it all into a single frame. And that's the power of wide angle to give that different perspective uh, on, um, on the scene. Here's another one. This is uh, the uh, organ at Wells Cathedral. Now, again, this is a wide angle shot. Doesn't look like it, but it is. Um, uh, I'm using a wide angle lens, about 28 millimeter, no, 24 millimeter, something like that for this shot, because that is a huge, uh, a huge organ uh, and you we're looking up at it, which is again, the, the worm's eye view that we talked about last week, but I've compressed it down because normally you would have, you, you'd look up and you'd look up there and you look across because it's big from where you're standing. And I've used the power of the wide angle lens to compress that down into something we can see. I think the other thing about this image to do with it, the point of view on it is you notice something unique about this. Uh, no, I don't know whether it is unique, but uh, something unusual about it, in that there's a form of repetition going on here. There's a mirroring from left to right on, on it. And that works because I have found the midpoint when creating this image. And I deliberately found that midpoint. And I do this quite consciously when I'm creating images. But if you went to Wells Cathedral and you were looking at this organ, the chances are you wouldn't be looking for the midpoint. You'd, you'd be standing perhaps off to one side and you'd look up at it and you'd walk around. But you only get this view, this symmetry in the image, if you are positioned on the midline, the midpoint of it. So I've found that point of view where I've compressed everything, and I found the midpoint to get this mirroring effect between the two halves of the image. Um, uh, another one with um, using the wide angle uh, to, uh, to create an effect uh, with it. Now, this is the boxing gym that's uh, dark, well, that way above me. Um, it's in the same building that my studio is in. And uh, I was doing a job for, uh, for Master Scan. He wanted some publicity images. And I went up to when they were sparring in the ring. And I learned a couple of things about uh, photographing boxing on, uh, on that assignment. Uh, first of all, that those ropes uh, are a real pain because they cut right across the image. Uh, and the, I learned that the solution is getting close, use a wide angle lens because that distortion that it creates gives me this wider view of the boxes. And you can see more, much more of the boxes in the image by looking through the ropes. The second thing I learned is that there is a lot of elasticity to them and they bounce back an awful long way, a lot more than you might expect. And once I got that shot, I decided perhaps I ought to shoot from a little bit further away. But what's happened here, I've 
that view you couldn't normally get. If you were watching that match, you wouldn't see it like that uh, because your eye wouldn't see the whole thing. Um, so I've used the wide angle lens to emphasize the opening of the, of the ropes, the gap between the ropes for the, the image to work. And I've been able to come in close on there. So it's putting the camera where the eye doesn't normally go yeah, on that. And then we go the other way. How do we normally see something? We see something at a distance first, and then we come in close. So another way of changing your, yeah, your image is to shoot details. And I'm a big fan of detail shots. And sometimes a detail shot without everything else around it is very powerful without seeing the distance um, and the context of it first. Now, this uh, carving is in the Vatican Museum in Rome. Um, and yeah, it, it's quite ferocious. But I think this version of it, which is coming in a lot, lot closer and just concentrating on the claws there on the neck, uh, really shows up the ferocity of that uh, far better than the, the larger image does. And I think this is a much more compelling shot uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the, the wider uh, image in there. Again, coming in close, getting a detail. What about a dripping tap? We don't normally look at taps like that. And, and this close-up shot really works because we're seeing the world in a way that Perhaps we don't normally see it. Not only that, I've suspended the drops of water in the shot, uh, which again, suspending time, it gives us a perspective on things that we're not used to. And if we present our viewers with a view on something that's different to how they would normally perceive it, that immediately causes the brain to go, oh, that's different. And it becomes an image that is interesting to your viewers. So here's another, just a general uh, case study image, actually. And this one is the, um, one of the gates at Jarash in, uh, in Jordan. And it's a perfectly adequate shot, just nothing spectacular. Um, except I got in, when I get in closer, I can do something to make it a much more extraordinary shot. So what have I done here? I've used that worm's eye view, but I've done something else. I've put a tilt uh, in there as well. By putting it on an angle, it makes the image much more striking um, and makes it much more unusual. And, the, and your brain goes, oh, what's going on there? What am I looking at? And you start to think about the image. And same here. Um, this is another uh, quirky angle shot, a theater uh, one here at Stockport Garrick, servant of, servant of two masters um, here. Now, the background for this was painted, and it's Venice, but it had sky at the top, it had water at the bottom, and it just had this thin line through of buildings. It, it, it was a lovely background for the play, but with photographs, it, it, didn't, it was just a bit odd. So what I've done is I tilted the camera to create this quirky angle, and I think it makes the image much stronger for having that um, tilt in there. Now, that, I call them quirky angles. The technical name is a Dutch angle. Where does the name come from? It has nothing to do with the Netherlands. It actually comes from German cinematography, probably around about the 1920s, so about 100 years old. And what it's all about is some of the early German um, cinematographers used to tilt the can camera um, in their films to create a, an uneasiness in it. Now, Hitchcock's done it a lot as well with some, some of his. You'll notice a lot of the angles in his. He just tilts the can camera, and it just gives this sense of unease. This makes the, the mind go, oh, there's something a bit weird going on here. And it was originally known, because it, was, it, it started in the German fil film industry, as the Deutsche Angle. Well, the English speakers um, couldn't cope with pronouncing Deutsche, uh, so it got uh, anglicized to not Deutsche, but Dutch, the Dutch angle. So that's where it comes from. And another example here, uh, one of my shots of Stockport Viaduct, uh, 
on the back of my business card and uh, photo that photo is up in my studio. Uh, one of my favorite shots, I use it as a banner image on uh, a few places as well. And the Dutch angle on there, I think really makes the image work. And I think it's much stronger than the one without the tilt, even though the one without the tilt's got the train on. And so I think that angle really helps the, uh, uh, the image uh, on there. Also with the tilts, here's a, an example, um, the War Memorial in um, um, Heaton Moor, shot from behind. Now I've got that angle on there, I've tilted the camera, it gives it a different perspective on it, but it also highlights my last point about point of view and perspective and pulling the camera where the eye doesn't normally go. Uh, Terry, um, I know Terry lives not that far from this war memorial and he will know it well, uh, but uh, how often, Terry, have you ever been around the back of there? We just don't look at the back of these things. And sometimes uh, the, the back view is a much more interesting view and it causes the brain uh, to go, oh, I haven't seen the world, seen that subject like that because we take it from um, a different angle. And as I often say, sometimes, just sometimes, the back of the subject is as interesting as the front. And I'm sure you all recognize this. It's the uh, death mask of King, of King Tutankhamun. Uh, but how often do you see it from the back? We don't. We always see the front view. But this back view, I think, is equally striking. So. That's my um, little bit of uh, tutorial stuff for tonight uh, about uh, using uh, a, a few techniques. The ones we talked about last week, the, uh, the positioning, the worm's eye view and the bird's eye view. Then this week we looked at, um, what did we look at? We looked at uh, using angles, using wide angles to capture the scene using details. We looked at uh, tilting, uh, tilting the frame. We looked at another one as well. And my mind has just completely gone blank. What was the third one? The third one was, why has my mind gone blank? Uh, not the details, right back at the very beginning. No, angle of view, tilt of the camera. No, no, no. Height off the ground, angle of view. No, it was just two. I was thinking, I know there's three. It's because I split it over two weeks. That's what's going on. Brain fade, sorry. <laughs> right, let's get this back to where I should be on the PowerPoints. And hopefully my brain's in gear. Right, okay, for those of you um, doing, um, um, most of you know, I have to mention my sponsor, and my sponsor is, as ever, uh, you. And this week, uh, my cup of tea is thanks to Andy Grady. And not only did he pay for the cup of tea, but he bought, he bought me a mug as well. So it's got my name on it. It's got the studio logo on it. And... I'm just thinking I should have a close-up shot uh, programmed in here. I don't think I have. Yes, I have. There you go. I'm just about to say it, the studio logo on there. And just so there's no mistake, if anyone's brewing up for me in the studio, there's the instructions. Tea, milk, no sugar. So as it says on that side of it, thanks, Andy. Uh, thanks for the, the, not only the cuppa, but the mug as well. Right, so what's the buy me a tea all about? Well, it's basically buy me a coffee that a lot of the YouTubers use. Uh, I don't drink coffee, so I got my URL renamed to buy me a tea. And if you find these live streams uh, helpful and you're a regular viewer, uh, then um, I would just say, if you want to buy me a cup of tea through that link as a way of saying thank you for the uh, uh, for the live streams and keeping me on air, then it's down to that. There's no obligation to do it. I'll be doing them anyway, but I really appreciate every cup of tea that people have bought for me. 
So thank you for that. And right, moving along. Let's have a look what's been going on in chat. So uh, we have one question. I think the question came in when I was talking about the wide angle lenses. And I think I was shooting about 24 millimeter on those examples. So um, it would be my 24-105 lens, but using it at the wide angle uh, setting on there. Uh, with that, I'm on a full frame uh, camera, so it was it would be a true 24 millimeter uh, lens on that. And Terry says he has been around the back of the statue doing one of my exercises as it happens. So right. Let's move on. And now let's get on to uh, feedback and I'll move over into Lightroom to do that. So here we go in Lightroom and let's have a look at what we've got this week. Uh, the first image was from Gary. It was brought in. It, it, this was the one which was emailed to me. Now, um, let's have a look at uh, Gary's settings on here. Um, he's shot at f4 uh, to try and get a shallow depth of field on there. 70 millimeter uh, focal length on a 24 to 70 millimeter. And he's chosen f4 on there. Could have gone as far as f2.8. Let's have a look at the image and see what the... Yeah, definitely didn't want to go 2.8 on that because it's... This is one where I think having a little bit more depth of field to it is good. Right. Um, initial thoughts on this. The settings, not bad, um, Gary, on, uh, uh, on this. I would say this isn't one of your best images. I've seen much better shots from you. And if I'm perfectly honest, I'd say, I think this one's a little bit lacklustre compared to um, your other work. Why is that? Well, um, first of all, I think the subjects, um, okay, I know you can't bring flowers back to life, but it's a little bit dead in places. So I don't know what, how many other um, flowers and orchids, I think it's an orchid, are around, were around that you could have shot, but it, it does look a little bit worse for wear on there. The other thing I'm not so sure of is this positioning bang in the middle of the frame on it. Um, I'd like to see it sort of off center. I don't think bang in the middle really works for this for a number of reasons. We've got little things at the top which are drawing my eye. Um, I know you couldn't change it, but that blade of grass, I, I really don't like either um, on there. But let's see if I could crop this slightly differently and see what we can get from it. So bring that down to something along there. Now, I think that's working a little bit better. And why is it? Well, it makes it a bit larger in the frame. It puts it on that one third line. And now this blade of grass, which we're stuck with, uh, we've got that acting as a sort of lead in line uh, on there. It's a strong diagonal that's sort of pointing towards the flowers. Unfortunately, the bit it's pointing to is the dead, uh, the dead part on there. Um, what has worked and what is good on this is that blurred background, that almost watercolor effect on the background has worked really well on there. Um, yeah, um, I think, as I said, I think I've seen better from you, uh, uh, Gary, uh, on that. It doesn't quite have the wow factor that some of your other shots um, have got. Uh, it, it, on, on my honest opinion on there, uh, on that. So moving along. Uh, Sonia, I don't think Sonia's watching these live streams, it's certainly not live. Um, again, another one of her 
I think this is uh, an underwater shot. I think it's an underwater coral on there. Lovely um, colours, and the orange works well with the brown background. Um, I haven't got any settings on there. It's um, it's a Facebook image. They're all Facebook images now, so I can't really check the um, uh, the focus because that's one hundred percent on there. Uh, but it, it looks good. That, that's about the best I can say um, on there. I'm not really on anything very constructive other, other than to say that the colours work well together with it um, on that one. Uh, John, right, okay. Um, I know you've been quite prolific over this last week. Uh, I think you you must be away at the moment. Um, I hope you get to see this. Um, um, the drone shots and the others. I would say... John, and I've given you this, this note before, try and find your best shots and just post those. Um, I don't know, I, I can't advise too much about the drone, but if I look at this, there's something really odd here. The horizon, and I don't think that is landmass um, that's causing that kink uh, there. It, it looks almost as it's not joining up properly uh, on it. And I don't know with the waves either whether there's something weird going on uh, down, down there. Uh, but there, there looks something a little bit odd here with that horizon. And I would suggest if that's an image that you need to do, and I think the concept's quite good, this, the beach leading in, but I would like to see very much a different crop on this. You don't need all that sky. I would say, let's make this more or less a square crop. Actually, I will go with a square crop on it. And I would be tempted to do something like that. Um, and I think that is much more powerful, just sort of leading in except we've got this horrible problem here. There's definitely something a bit weird about that join in the horizon there. And I can't work out what it is, whether it doesn't look real to me uh, on that. Uh, please, if you watch this, John, correct me and tell me that I'm wrong on that and tell me what's going on there. Uh, Ruskin, I hope you watch these. Uh, I know you post them. And I know you often say that you're watching, but... Um, I, I'm going to give you the same note as I've given before. These are brilliant images, the wildlife that you do of India. And this is um, a J from, from memory. Um, it looks fantastic. I love the depth of field on it. I just wish you'd send me the image directly to feedback at ians-studio.co.uk because I really need to look at your shooting data to be able to give you any more pointers on these. You've got some cracking shots, and my appeal goes out to you yet again. Please, please send me some of the originals so that I can give you some sensible feedback, because that's 100%. And I can't tell whether it's um, critical focus on there. Um, it certainly looks fantastic on the screen, but if it was blown up, would it still carry on? I don't know. What were the settings on that? I don't know um, with it because uh, it's all stripped out by Facebook uh, with it. So please email them to me um, at uh, feedback at ians-studio.co.uk. Right, Sonia, right. Um, another one of your uh, not uh, at sea images. This one's um, an interesting shot. I like the subject. Um, there's one area of problem and one really good thing. And unfortunately, um, the two are connected. I like the, the framing technique of using the tree here uh, over the sky and the, this framing of the, uh, the tree on one edge there. But that's meant that there's a post sticking up here, which is really annoying me and really bugging me uh, on that. I'm going to have a go at getting rid of it. I don't know whether this is going to work in Lightroom, 
but I'm going to have a go. So a small adjustment brush, Q. Not, um, and I'm just going to take out the top bit of that there. And you can see it's, take, it's taken that from the wrong place. And now if I can match that up down here to about there, and then I'm just going to try doing that as a separate item. And again, it's taken it from the wrong place. I'm just going to play around with it a little bit. Uh, something like that. Yeah, not a very good job. I'd have been better off doing that one in Photoshop, um, to be honest. If I wanted to spend a bit more time on it, I could get rid of it. And that really opens the image up. So I would advise spending the time to try and edit that out uh, on there. Or what would have happened if you just moved a little bit further forward so that that post was just out of shot? Um, You'd have probably lost this tree, the framing device there, and the branches over the top. I don't know what that would have done to the composition. It might have actually helped because it's quite a busy shot with lots of things in it. And I'm thinking that maybe without the trees over the top on this, it might be the better shot where that lovely blue sky, we can actually see it properly on there. So those are a couple of things to think about with that, um, Sonia. Julie. Hi, Julie. Welcome to the live stream. And um, these two images that you've done with the, um, uh, the flowers. First of all, these dandelion clocks. And it's a large enough image on there. And boy, is that tack sharp. That is absolutely pin sharp on there. And you have avoided the trap that happens almost every time somebody photographs a dandelion clock. And that is that the ones in the foreground get so out of focus that it looks like you've just got an outer rim of in-focus um, uh, seeds on the, uh, on the dandelion clock. Now, I don't know what the settings were that you were using, but you've got a sufficient depth of field on there to have got, they are just slightly out of focus, the ones in the foreground, but they are sufficiently in focus that you can see them and it doesn't give that, ri that ring effect. Um, it does fill in uh, on there. Um, so it just works, but yet you've got shallow enough depth of field that all of the grass is out of focus. Now, it's bang in the middle of the shot. Uh, I wonder whether, I, part of me quite likes the long stems in there, but I'm just wondering whether a slightly different crop with this might be the better one. If I just bring that in a little bit tighter, just something like that. I'm trying to just get it over on one side. And I think that might be a slightly better crop with it um, on there. That just takes it off center. We keep this on the, the one, the, the, what I refer to as the hero flower, the one in the foreground, the one that we're focused on, is now on our one third lines. So if I change my overlay, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's on the one third, slightly above uh, on there, but that's close enough on that. Um, and I think that works. Now, we've got a slight problem here in that these areas of light are pulling the eye away a little bit. So what I would do, again, the uh, spot removal brush, I would just try and deal with those like that. And I think that just helps it that little bit uh, on there. Um, I like the fact that the backgrounds, you can tell that it's a grassy background. I like the fact that you've got down or you've got the camera down to flower level and you're shooting at its height. Because so often we photograph, these get photographed from above looking down and it doesn't work uh, as well as getting down to the flower's height uh, on there, which is what you've done. The other perspective you could have done is that worm's eye view 
coming in right below looking up, but that depends on what was above. If you've got this blue sky above, that might have been a really interesting perspective on it. I don't know whether you saw last week's uh, live stream, but if you did, Julie, um, or if you haven't, go, go and watch it because I talk about doing this with flowers. And I've got a really good example from Gary on there about pulling the camera down below, shooting up uh, on things. So that could also have worked with it. So moving on to the um, to the next image, and this is um, uh, from Richard Lovelock. And uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, it's a load of rubbish, Richard. Uh, no, nah, I don't like it at all. Horrible shot. <laughs> I'm only joking. Um, there's not a lot I can say. It's just absolutely fantastic. This whole sequence of Kingfisher shots that you've done. I think the other one that you posted, um, which I don't think was in, the, in my group, but you posted on your, your timeline, I think that was a slightly stronger one uh, than this one with the arms in. But uh, the, the, the way you've got it, you've, you've just an amazing, um, a, amazing shot. Uh, or series of images on there that you've caught the moment. Um, I'm not sure this is quite as sharp as the other one either. So I think the other one I've seen is the better one. Although there's, I think there's the I like the action on here. And I like the water on this one, particularly this arc coming up here. Uh, but uh, again, absolutely brilliant, Richard. What can I say? Um, uh, uh, I'd love to be able to take a shot like that. I, I really would. I, I just don't have the patience for it or the ability to get up that early, uh, which is required. Right, uh, another one of Julie's. Um, now, Julie, you said yourself uh, that you knew this image wasn't as sharp or as good as the previous ones. Now, uh, I don't know the reason why um, that is. Um, I can hazard a few guesses, there doesn't appear to be anything that's perfectly tack sharp on there. So I'm without the shooting data. This is why I keep saying to people, please email the images to me, feedback at ians-studio.co.uk. Uh, without that shooting da data, I couldn't tell you what's been going on here. The shooting data, I could probably interrogate where you'd focused. I might be able to know what your depth of field was. Um, I think it's probably forward focused on this and possibly you weren't, you didn't have a fast enough shutter speed. I suspect there might be just a fraction of camera shake with it as well, thus causing the um, a slight blur, blurriness. So my advice with something like this, this is where having, but doing these types of shots Having a good solid tripod is helpful. And if you were on tripod, I don't know whether you were or weren't, then using a remote release so that you don't get um, this shake. If your tripod's not perfectly solid, then do two things. Set yourself timer to two seconds um, for it and use a cable release or shutter, a remote shutter release so that you you press the release, it gives it chance to everything to settle down and then two seconds later. You can also do mirror lockup if it's not sharp, if the tripod's vibrating from the, the mirror moving, then um, do, do that so that when you, you'll have to do two clicks on there, first locks the mirror up if you've got a, um, a camera with a mirror. I don't have to do that anymore. I've got mirrorless. Um, and then um, two seconds later, it takes the uh, it then takes the shot um, on it. So you could do something like that. Uh, that might account for it. But without the um, the shooting data, I couldn't tell you more. Where do you focus on something like this? Well, you need to. I talked about when there's a group of flowers deciding on your hero flower. When you've got one flower like this, or one thistle or whatever it is, you choose where your hero petal is. And I would say your hero petal should be about probably this one um, uh, here. 
because that's a, just a little way in. You hopefully will then get a bit more around here, or potentially that dark one could be your hero petal on it um, uh, with that. And that gives you the, a point of focus within there. I suspect that it's slightly forward focused, but even that's not, uh, that not truly sharp uh, with it. The other thing to watch is this, you've got a white pole in the background. So if you have moved very slightly to one side, that pole would have been off the, uh, the side of the shot with there. So that's the other thing to think about. Think what's in the background. Even though it's out of focus, that white area is going to draw the eye away from the flower. So that's my, my suggestions on there. Uh, Richard, right. Um, okay, after your, um, uh, uh, your amazing Kingfisher, uh, shot we have this and um, all right what can I say about it I don't think we're seeing quite enough of the of the subject uh, here I think uh, there's bits of the subject I'd like to see more of um, uh, th there's a person hiding the car um, on there. I'd love to see more about the car. No, I'm joking. It's obviously it's a subject about the um, uh, it's the model reclining in the car. Now, I in some ways this works. I like the use of the color, the red and the the yellow work. The feet acting as a lead into it work um, uh, on there. Uh, the uh, the Quentin. And Tarantino um, top and the the bride look um, top all um, all works with that. I just find the pose is a bit weird because no one in their right mind would sit in the driver's seat of a car in that position, and it just it looks uncomfortable, feels uncomfortable, and to my mind that sort of kind of takes me out of the image. I would like to know more about the car because it's obviously it's a left-hand drive. I'm wondering whether it's an American car. Um, so I'm, I'm a little bit of a petrol head at heart. So uh, I, I'm, I'm more intrigued about the car than the model, I'm afraid. Uh, I'd just like to know a bit more uh, about it um, uh, on there uh, uh, with it. But it's an interesting shot. Let me just see point of focus yeah it uh, looks as though it's all in focus uh, on it I do like the shallow depth of field with it I'm assuming it's um, available light on there um, just looking at it though the the sharp the sharpest bit of focus looks almost as though it's right on the background um, on that again, it's one of those without the uh, the full res image. It's very difficult to comment on uh, to know whether the uh, the focus point really is on the eyes or not. Uh, and I'm not entirely convinced. I think that background's got the focus rather than the eye uh, with it. If I'm being a little bit picky uh, on it. Oh, and the other thing, the um, the wing mirror and the cobwebs on there slightly distracting on that. So again, using a car for a shoot, make sure everything's clean uh, uh, on there uh, with it. Um, so yeah, that's my comment on that one. So thanks for, for sharing that. I think that's all the, the feedback on there. So let's head back over to my slides and see what's going on. Right. Um, Let's move on and look at the comments on there. So, the right, oh, Living YouTube has logged me out again. Um, and so I haven't got all the... Um, Right, okay, now I'm getting all the things, uh, because I only get the last few on the screen there. Um, right. Oh, John Barton is on here. Um, 
and he's saying that, yeah, the drone shot is square panorama. Uh, so, so, yeah, I think it's not doing its job on the stitching terribly well uh, on that. Um, Julie's saying it took 20 minutes to get to get the one shot and she took about 40 photos. Yep, that's fine. That's about par for the course. Can be with those um, on there. Um, um, Richard saying, I see a heart in this. Um, yeah, I, there's, there is a heart on, um, if you're referring to, to um, the likes and the hearts on um, uh, your portfolio, then yeah, definitely. Um, uh, Ju um, Julie saying it's an incredible photo, Richard. Indeed it is. Uh, everyone, I think, has to agree with that. Um, yeah, um, Richard saying eight hours being eaten alive on the riverbank. Yeah, and that is why I don't do wildlife photography uh, on that. Um, uh, oh, Julie was saying the flower, the, the second flower was being held by someone. Um, right, uh, yeah, and it's napweed. Okay. Um, on that, but yeah, that's the that's probably a combination of the person holding it, um, you holding the camera, not on tripod, and, and things like that. So often with these, as you found out with the first one, it takes time to get the shot, and that's the difference between um, your first image, Julie, which took you twenty minutes to get and forty attempts is so much better than the spur of the moment shot. Richard's um, uh, shot of the Kingfisher took eight hours to get. And that's the sort of level of de dedication um, that it, it takes to get those, some of those absolutely incredible uh, images. And sometimes we just expect uh, we live in an instant age, and we just expect to be able to get our images like that. Uh, and the really stunning photos, as um, um, as you can see uh, from from these, the the absolute best ones are the ones where people have put the effort into. And in two weeks' time, I'm going to be talking a little bit more about this idea. Um, and I call it working the scene. And I'm going to talk about that, how we work a scene to make sure we've, we've got out of a scene the absolute best we can from it and what the thought process should be. Uh, and I'll give it basically as a case study uh, from one of my travels in particular. It was, believe it or not, it, it was just a lamppost. And I spent a long while working the scene to get the perfect shot on it. And I want to talk you through that process and how the mind works on it um, as, uh, as part of uh, the live stream in two weeks' time. So um, that's coming up. So member photo of the week. Uh, and right, ba basically from the ones I've had on the screen, and you've heard me absolutely raving about a couple of images tonight. So I suspect it'll come as no surprise that this week's member photo of the week is this one from Julie. Ah, you all thought I was going to say the Kingfisher, didn't you? Yeah, but no, um, I went for this one uh, because um, I think... No, knowing where Julie is at with her photography and knowing the effort that she would have put into creating this shot. Um, she's been away from photography for five years, um, partly due to uh, health reasons, but she's not been able to do photography, um, to actually get back to it and then produce something like this. I thought that was a, a really worthy 
um, image. I mean, Richard's was absolutely fantastic, but I, I just wanted to act, particularly acknowledge Julie tonight uh, and this week uh, for the work that she put into that, and just to encourage her. Uh, to, I want this to be a real encouragement for you, Julie, to, to really get back with your photography on there because uh, you are a good photographer and I love seeing your photos. So well done. And this is what it will look like on the banner and I'll be pulling that up there in a few minutes time. So, so well done, um, uh, Julie. You can see I've extended the background slightly to make it work as part of the banner. I uh, hope you'll forgive me for that. Uh, on there. And uh, whose image will it be next week? Keep submitting to uh, Facebook and send them as well to me um, for, um, uh, uh, to, so I've got them for review as well. Uh, so thank you um, uh, everyone for being part of it. I've kept it under the hour uh, this week. Um, it's um, uh, from a show which I wondered what I was going to do after Friday. I'm glad I managed to pull it together tonight. So thank you very much for, for being with me tonight. Look forward to seeing your images during the week. And uh, just to let you know, next week, whatever happens, um, it will be natural light portraits. If I can't do the video that I'm trying to produce, I've got pre-shot a set of images which I can use um, to, to tell the tale, but I'd rather do it as a, as a pre-recorded demo with a subject uh, during the week. But it's reliant on having a subject, having an assistant, and having the right weather for it, because I need harsh sunlight uh, to be able to, um, to do what I want to, want to do. So hopefully I'll have that next week. But even if I don't, I will definitely give my talk on uh, natural light uh, portraits and give you some advice on, uh, on doing that. So if you've got images on that theme, please post them to the Facebook group and email them to feedback at ians-studio.co.uk. I'm going to keep saying it until people start doing it uh, on there. So thanks for watching, folks. And until next time, Keep making great photos. Bye for now.